All right. Well, thank you very much once again. Um, well, today um, I'd like uh, to tell you a story. Um, and this is a story of success. Um, it is also a story of courage. Um, it, is a it is a story of resilience. Uh, but is it also a story of challenge? And it's a story of, of polio eradication. And um, I don't know how many uh, colleagues have, you know, know much about polio eradication, but I thought it would be worthwhile to uh, maybe present or start up with a slide um, about what polio eradication is and what, what polio is. Um, polio eradication um, was launched in, in 1985 uh, with support of Rotary International, um, a group of volunteers who pledged to, to vaccinate uh, children all over the world uh, against, a, against a disease that causes uh, paralysis. And this initiative was formed in 1988 at the World Health Assembly and with support of more than 200 countries, 20 million volunteers, the initiative and the partnership has been able to vaccinate more than 2.5 billion children uh, of the world. Um, it's not so long ago, about 30 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, where roughly we had 1,000 children paralyzed every day due to polio. And because of their cooperation and goodwill, and support of donors, partners, and regular people all over the world who contributed, who supported, who, who donated their time, who supported the campaign publicly. Polio education been able to curb uh, polio incidents more than 99%. And we are really at the last mile. As you see today, polio exists only, wild polio virus exists only in two uh, countries um, in the world. However, despite of all of the success, reaching the last mile have proven to be more challenging than anticipated. And vaccine acceptance is among other factors that contribute to this lengthy last mile and the dedicated efforts and commitment that the program needs to achieve and achieve excellence. So in order to eradicate polio, we need to, we need to bring the immunity level. We need to vaccinate sufficient number of, of children under five all over the world. So there is no reservoir uh, for the virus, wild virus to breed. And once that is done and several years from certification, there will be no longer vaccination needed against polio. So this is what essentially eradication means. So today, polio, still lives in certain spots of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the program has been largely successful and, and managed to, to, to curb the virus in the two countries. However, there are still areas, and these areas are most difficult to reach. They're most uh, hard to reach communities. They're often more, most conservative communities, which still have strong, deep beliefs and values. Uh, which the program is trying to um, address. And some of the areas you, you would see here, such as Karachi, the parts of Karachi, not all Karachi, parts of Peshawar, parts of Balochistan in Pakistan, and areas in Afghanistan where we are still working hard to, to convince and to, to get the support of communities and parents to, to get vaccinated. And it's not a, such a, an easy thing to do. If you think about it for a second, polio vaccinations are done several times a year. This is the campaign uh, you know, where essentially your child, if you were to live in, in Pakistan today, your child would get polio vaccine, um, well, no less than six, eight, in some areas, 10 times a year. And to build that sufficient level of immunity, this is what, what it requires, a high quality campaign and achieving that has proven indeed um, to be a challenge. So I'd like to talk to you about a Peshawar incident which happened on April 22nd, 2019. 
Um, and I'm no stranger to Pakistan. I, I visit country regularly. I work there. I live there. And, and, it, and, and I was happened to be there uh, just right after the, this incident. And, uh, and I must say, as a communication uh, professional, I, I, I have not, not witnessed ever um, this kind of a, uh, you know, this kind of a level of events and, and, and kind of an impact which it had. And it certainly made me rethink um, how we are approaching uh, uh, polio education and how we are approaching our engagement in digital uh, spaces. So I'd like to tell you a story. So this was a, this was a, a polio campaign. So, so in Peshawar city. And, and Peshawar is a vibrant uh, city of roughly population, 2.2 million people, uh, which is essentially a crossroad between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and it's 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 interesting city. It's 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 slightly packed. It's it's conservative, but at the same time, it's a it's 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 a trade hub. Um, it's a it's a transit hub, and, and you would find um, you know many many different and welcoming. Uh, people uh, uh, in Peshawar, like like in many other areas of Pakistan and in Pakistan in general. Um, so this was a regular campaign, uh, or yet another campaign, where vaccination teams were getting ready um, and getting ready vaccination uh, uh, cold chain boxes and, uh, uh, and and their vaccination plans, and they 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 getting ready to go to the community and started the vaccination door to door, but also. Um, children which were not only five years of age but this time the vaccination covered uh, children of 10 years of age because there was evidence that uh, polio is also this the transmission um, in the in the older age group and uh, therefore it was needed to to immunize um, these children um, and in the early hours of the day um, there was a video which made it to the first digital space of the mainstream media channel, uh, which then later has been recirculated um, across all sorts of social and media platforms. And this person that you see in front of you on the screens, Nazar Muhammad, is a, is a resident of Peshawar, Mashakel area. Um, and allegedly he filmed two staged anti-vaccination videos, which basically went viral and on those videos i'm gonna i'm gonna play the clip it's without the sound but um certainly you uh should be able to appreciate the the intensity and uh, you know of this video where he claimed that following polio vaccination uh the children have uh lost conscience and a lot of the children have been hospitalized and Despite the fact that this video is obviously fake, um, there's been a lot of pickup and circulation uh, of this content. So what happened next? And next, there was a tsunami of fake news and misinformation all over social and digital media. There were more than 18,000 um, retweets and likes um, of that same um, video. And this has happened in the, in the range of hours. So despite the fact that the program has um, tried to respond um, according to the standard operating procedures and uh, you know, had, the, had the, a press conference and uh, tried to curb some of these misinformation in a, such a short period of time, it was simply impossible to get control of this situation. Um, and here I'd like to uh, bring a graph, which was, was, was produced in a very interesting case study from, uh, from a first draft, our, our colleagues and partners, and we've engaged with them uh, before. And I understand Claire, we will also uh, speak uh, this afternoon. Uh, but very interestingly, uh, you know, there's, there's also a lot of understanding and evidence how these rumors and misinformation had spread. Um, and it looks like it wasn't just the social media, it was the, some of the mainstream channels that, that went in the digital space uh, into the social media and then uh, the information was retweeted. And, and the other interesting finding from that study was 
that some of the pro-vaccination celebrities who, in an attempt to, to control uh, for this misinformation and who retweeted this content, may themselves have contributed to the, to the spread because they have thousands and thousands of followers and uh, those simply hesitating parents or concerned parents um, may have kind of a shifted in that, in that continuum. And one thing to understand is um, vaccine acceptance is not a steady state. And, and I think Saad had mentioned that human behavior, and we, we tend to appreciate, is incredibly complex phenomena. And when you agree to something one day, you can disagree or shift in that continuum or acceptance or rejection continuum uh, quite, quite easily. And, and, and therefore, it, it, had a, it had a significant impact. And another interesting finding from that study was that on those days, if you, one of the most top searches related to vaccines, let alone polio, vaccines or vaccination in that day, the top question was whether polio vaccine is safe. And that certainly tells a lot where basically polio vaccine equals all vaccines. And that effect is pronounced and we had some evidence as well that it may have affected routine immunization because for, for parents, vaccine is a vaccine. Now I'd like to speak about the ripple effect. And the ripple effect essentially was pronounced offline. The rumors had quickly spread from social media and mainstream media to offline. It burned from the communities. Mosques were announcing that if your child was in school today, they had been given polio vaccine, your child may be at risk. And there were even announcements or, or reference to polio drops as being poisonous. And it's very natural that concerned parents, even those that were accepting before the vaccine, have brought, within two days, have brought nearly 45,000 children to the hospitals in Peshawar for checkup. And on the same afternoon, the angry mob and, and protesters, and, and, and many of them are concerned parents, I don't want to frame them in, the, in that way, because genuinely there was a, there was a, there was a panic. Um, a set clinic on fire. And in the aftermath of protests, in the, in the next several days, the, there were two police officers and, and a health worker who tragically died, lost their lives related to these products. But one of the biggest impacts that we have seen is that frontline workers, and we have more than 250,000 frontline workers, committed women, men, volunteers, who, who go door to door, day and night, um, they've been, some of them been beaten, stoned, and certainly harassed, and their morale, their morale has also went down. And some of them also started seeing doubts. The communication internally within our networks was of significant importance to be able to help our teams to make sense of what was going on. And the last thing is that polio campaign was suspended for months after this incident, and there was no opportunity to restore the campaign. Now, I must say that the Pakistan government and the program GPA Partners on the Ground have, have taken steps to, to, to mitigate the aftermath effects, and there's been a, um, a, so, a, a social media campaign, there's been a, a, a communication program uh, to rebuild the confidence in vaccine, in the program. But yet this proves to be a very challenging and, and a long-term goal that, that an objective that we need to resolve. So rebuilding that confidence, it can be lost fairly quickly, but then rebuilding that takes time. And here I would like to show you one, one graph, which is essentially an evidence of what that means. So the blue area that you see on your graph is 
or are the, the children or other parents that refuse or deny polio vaccination to their children. And the red area that you see are the, the same children which, which still deny after social mobilizers and, and teams on the ground went ahead and tried to resolve this refusal. And as you see during Peshawar incident, the number of recorded refusals have spiked. There were reports of nearly 1 million refusals. And as you can see, very few of them has been resolved. And the fact, the reason is that the campaign had been stopped and there was simply no opportunity to continue conversation under those conditions. I also would like to draw your attention to, to the fact that um, if you look at the, at, the, at the right corner of the graph, the, the red area, these are roughly 200,000 children which were still missed during December campaign. And comparing that to earlier records in January, that's twice as much. So, so resolving that even after the shock is gone, we're still aftershocks. There's still kind of a longer term effects that, that may happen. I must give credit to, um, to Pakistan program for, you know, and to, to communication teams on the ground, social mobilizers um, and public partnership uh, to, to, to who can who try to resolve this. And, and as you see, the trend now is, is positive during the last campaign, the national campaign that's been held, that number is going down. So the trajectory is right, but the amount of efforts that it needed uh, is, just, is just astonishing. I would like to um, maybe to make one point here, maybe just not to, to misrepresent um, the importance of, of what's happening online and in digital space. So, so this point is, is, what is rather important. Prior to Peshawar incident, there's been in what we call an epidemic of door knocks. A polio campaign with the quite frequent campaigns, a polio program, and quite an aggressive strategy. There's been a, basically four campaigns in a row. And in an effort to eradicate polio, where you need to give many doses of, of polio vaccine during the short interval time to ensure that you catch mobile population, to ensure that you catch children that are born. And let's not forget Pakistan is a country with a, with a massive population and thousands of children are born um, every day. Um, so, so that kind of frequent approach and frequent approach to resolve refusals have really created a, a fertile soil to, um, to this kind of a misinformation. So it's not that just the video has went viral. Yes, it did, but it did land in a very fertile conditions. And from our key learnings is that although misinformation does fuel online and it burns for social media, but it does originate very often offline. And really understanding that connection between um, how information travels uh, through social media networks and platforms and mainstream media, like at what stage does it make, make it to the mainstream media? At what stage does it become legitimate? Um, it's important to understand that, and, I, and I'm glad I saw a number of, uh, I think, uh, topics that would be discussed in this conference, particularly from scientists um, in this area of world to understand how, what are the nodes, what are the communities, who becomes anti-vaccinator, who becomes pro-vaccinator, who is hesitant, how do conversations happen in those spaces. But probably one of the most important things, I understand the synergy between online world and the brick and mortar world, our traditional world where we live. And social mobilizers, religious leaders, caregivers, uh, all of us all have mobile phones at hand with relatively cheap access to mobile internet. And that's not an, uh, that's not an exclusion. I mean, you go to the, to the very far reaching areas of, of, of Peshawar or Kandahar, you will find people with smartphones and it would be a fallacy to think that they, they don't live, they live in an isolated world. These are, these are highly refined communities and they also have the digital spaces and the conversation happens both online and offline. And understand how we can merge the traditional communication for development approaches, communicate traditional behavioral science approaches or behavioral insights 
and public health with, with this online interaction. In our view, this is one of the important things to do. And building that resilience and, uh, would, be, would be important. So UNISA works with, with partners on the, on the framework, which, which we call Vaccination Demand Observatory. Um, and essentially, it's a, it's a framework that tries to do exactly that. It tries to combine and merge different disciplines. And that's where we understand this discussion around infodemics is, is very important. Um, so the first thing is to listen and listen to rumors and, and be able to detect new and early warning signals in broadcast media, in social media, and in real world. These are all interacting. And it's important to understand our caregivers, they're not recipients of that information, they're not receiving, they're participants. Our frontline workers, they are not just receivers of the content, but they generate content themselves. They're members of WhatsApp group, the conversations happen in WhatsApp and other closed platforms. And conversations then, you know, they escalate, they, they make it to the, to the mainstream media and go and make it back to the communities. But being able to understand and to analyze the signals from, from different areas and different platforms is, is that's where that intelligence and, the, and, and in our view, the, the future of that comes. Is, and that's why we're looking forward in the discussion in this conference is to, to really, how can we use different types of platforms and analytics to really come up with the actionable recommendations and insights. And last but not least, it's answering that famous, the so what question. We see a lot of traction and a lot of interest in trying to make sense of this fascinating uh, discipline. But then how do we translate that action on the ground? How do we build the capacity of the government, of the ministries, of civil society to be able to distill information, to be able to understand early signals to be able to preempt, maybe act as a, as a fire marshal rather than firefighter. Don't wait for this infodemic to spike, but maybe something can be done to prevent. And that cycle to repeat. So UNICEF is, is working with partners and, and really looking forward to, to really try to, to, to merge maybe these conversations because there's so many, um, interested parties working in this area, but we call for governance, we call for, for cooperation, and we call for, for bringing the, the, the minds and the societies and the, and the tech giants and the tech platforms together. Technical companies have, have been productive and they've been, they've been already supporting this, this action for about a year, but we need to make sure that that momentum is not lost and, and, and that momentum uh, goes forward. And all of this will give us a long-term capability to do surveillance and response for broader public health, beyond COVID, beyond immunization, beyond polio. But here I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the, the, the teams and many other colleagues who may not be listed here. Uh, I want to acknowledge the, of course, the Global Polio Education Initiative, a very noble partnership and cause, and many volunteers that, that, that support uh, this program and the donors and the governments. Um, I want to acknowledge a team in Pakistan, and not just the team that is there, uh, but also team who are really on the front lines, the team that are in vaccinators that are going door to door. They're, they're really our heroes, and they're, they're the ones who, who risk their lives um, for polio eradication. I'd like to say thank you to, uh, to the first draft team who, who helped us to compile a lot of these insights on what had happened in, in Pakistan, and certainly a uh, team, uh, team in New York, um, and many other colleagues. Um, if you'd like to learn more about, about UNICEF that uh, has a mandate to protect rights of children all over the world and make sure they are protected, immunized, nourished, educated, and thrive, do visit unicef.org. Uh, if you want to learn more about polio education and join the cause and join the effort, please visit polioeducation.org. And certainly if you'd like to know more about communication around polio and need some practical guides or support, um, uh, there's a website, polio.k.it. Well, I'd like to thank for, for giving me time and, uh, and certainly would, would be looking forward for your questions. And, but most important to learn both from panelists and, and participants. 
I unfortunately won't be stable for, for too long because of another meeting, but uh, I certainly will take, take the proceedings of this meeting forward and, and we would be looking uh, forward to, uh, uh, to work together on this. Thank you very much.